Well, thanks for joining me for the next 30 minutes or so. We're going to be launching into our study on the letter to the Philippian church. If you were able to join us last week or in, in person or whether you're following along on our YouTube channel, welcome. We gave you a bit of a overview of the entire letter, this four chapter, a very short letter written by the Apostle Paul to a, a place that he really never intended to, to visit and people that he really never intended to meet. And yet we looked at the content of this uh, incredible short letter that he wrote from a prison cell as he's sitting in Rome back to his people that he had met and people that he had not met yet uh, that have kind of came to Christ after his time as a result of a couple of families coming to place their, their faith and trust in the Lord. Paul writes this letter back. Now, before we launch into that, thank you for your support. Hopefully, you've jumped on our website, www.myfaithchurch.org. Um, click that donate button, or you can text a contribution to 73256. Take advantage of some of the resources that we've made available for you, whether it's uh, instructions about how to download the YouVersion Bible app or how to create your own personal uh, account of Right Now Media, sort of a Netflix of Bible studies that you can really just kind of feed yourself uh, throughout throughout the week. Well, we're going to jump in. Uh, begin really with the very first chapter, the first eight verses of this incredible, incredible letter that Paul has. So if you have your Bible, you can pause me. Uh, um, and I want you to grab your scriptures, and I'm just going to read the first eight verses, and this is where we're going to spend our time today as we look at this incredible letter. Before we comment on it, let's just kind of get an overview of these first eight verses that we're going to look at, and then we'll kind of jump back in and make some comments. So with no further ado, let me read from the scriptures here. This is chapter one, verse one. This is how Paul introduces himself and he gets right into sort of a very important topic in this particular letter. Paul and Timothy. Now we're going to talk more about Timothy later because he's mentioned in detail later on in this letter. But he says, Paul and Timothy, this is how he introduces himself. Bond servants of Jesus Christ. This is a word in the Greek. It's, a, it's this word doulos. It uh, means slave. And so he is linking himself in Timothy bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons he's talking about sort of the leadership of the church they're going to um, give them a bit of a, a, a welcome here grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all my joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, just as it is right for me to think this of all of you, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, this is the first eight verses that we have here of how Paul really introduces himself and also how he introduces really a topic that he's going to expand on throughout this entire short letter, four chapters, and it's the topic of, of joy. I mentioned last week that the word joy is repeated 16 times in this short letter. And here, right off, right off the right out of the gate, we, we have the first reference to this word joy. Now, joy. Is, is different than happiness, right? Happiness, we know this. Happiness is based on our happenings. I read a, an article, this was actually way back, written in um, 2019, I guess it's not that far back, but there was a survey of Americans and they asked if they were happy and uh, they didn't define happiness, they just asked, would you consider yourself happy? Well, one third of Americans consider themselves happy, at least, presently. So that means that two-thirds of, of, of Americans um, consider themselves unhappy. 
And, and that makes a lot of sense because happiness is based on what is happening to you, right? Uh, if you're able to look at our Take 5 segment from from Friday that went out, I think it went out Friday afternoon or maybe Saturday morning, it gives you a bit of a preview of what we're going to be discussing. I had a Happy Meal, right? So what are the contents of a Happy Meal? Well, you open it up and and it's not broccoli, right? It's, it's not sardines. I mean, what is in the Happy Meal, hopefully, is going to make you happy, right? We know that life will serve you various circumstances in your life. And if your happiness is based upon what life serves you, it will be dependent upon the arrangement of whatever is inside that you find acceptable to your current situations. So if you base your happiness on what has served you in terms of your health, if you're in good health, you're, you're going to be happy. If you base your happiness on, on um, whether or not your relationships are going well or how your kids are you, are doing or your, your financial situation, whatever you base your happiness on, that arrangement of circumstances, you will be able to say with the one-third of Americans that you are happy at least for the moment. But we know that happiness will change. You cannot be happy you, your entire life. You cannot, life will not always serve up Chicken McNuggets and, and hot fries. Sometimes you're going to get something nasty, you know, in there. So Paul introduces not happiness here in these first eight verses. He introduces something called joy. And he gives us this right out of the bat. He gives us this, what is his joy founded on? It's not founded on life's circumstances, arranging and coming together like, like clogs in a, in a, in a mechanism. His joy is founded and grounded on something that this life cannot be taken away. And he alludes to it, and you probably have seen this word as you remember back when I just read these eight verses, the word gospel. The word gospel is mentioned twice in these eight verses, and joy is connected in Paul's opinion, with the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is this collection of two words. It's good speak, good speech. And so it's good news. And what Paul is referring to, and this is sort of our key thought, is that Paul's joy is grounded and founded in what the gospel represents. He actually calls the Philippian believers, he calls them saints, and so Paul is including them that they are saints, that they have responded to this good speak, this, this good news. Now, what is this good news? Well, the good news is simply what Jesus has done. There's a problem, and before we can understand the good news, we have to understand the bad news, right? The bad news is this. It talks about it in Romans chapter 5. It's, it's all throughout the scripture. The, the bad news is this. We have something wrong with us. There is something that is wrong in the human race. It came through Adam. The world is broken. There is a separation between our creator and between us. There is this restlessness that we have in our lives. There is this inability to bridge that gap that is a result of our own sin Sin that's been passed on throughout the generations because we all have a sin nature. But also, it's not just the human race, but we look in the mirror. There is something that we know. There are evil thoughts that we have. There are evil actions that we have all committed. There is something that is bad news. And the bad news is this, that in and of ourselves, we are incapable. We are hopeless and we are helpless. In order for you to grasp the, the good news and respond to the good news, you first have to understand that there is bad news. Another way of putting this is this. You cannot understand that you need to be found unless you understand that you are lost. You are a lost cause. There is no hope. There is no help. And so when Paul was able to go to this place called Philippi, and he had a couple people there. One was Lydia. We looked at this last week. And another was not named by name. He's simply referred to as a, a, the Roman jailer. They had to respond first to this understanding that there is some bad news. 
No matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how you strive, there will be this separation that you are unable to bridge this gap because of sin between your creator God and you. There's, you are incapable. That's the bad news. The good news is this. Jesus, fully God and fully man, has provided a way for what, by what he has done, taking our place, being our substitute, receiving the punishment for what we deserved on the cross, defeated sin on the cross, defeated death and the power of the resurrection. And because of this, we, no matter who you are, for whosoever, the scripture tells us in John chapter three, right? For whosoever, regardless of your race, your economic status, whether you consider yourself a good person or a bad person, this is available for all, right? So whosoever will believe in him, shall receive eternal life. There's this idea of applying what Jesus has done on the cross and the power of the resurrection into your own life because Jesus has paid for your sins. So either you are gonna pay for your sins or Jesus who has already paid for your sins, but you have to receive this. This is the good news. You are not hopeless, you are not helpless. You are in yourself. But because of what Jesus has done, when you receive this, when you confess, when you ask for forgiveness, when you admit that you are incapable, that you are a sinner, that you are guilty, you can have, when you confess and when you ask for forgiveness and believe in who Jesus is, this is the good news that you have responded to because you understand that there is bad news. And when that occurs in your life, there is a foundation that is established for your joy that other people do not have. Those who have not responded to the good news, perhaps because they haven't fully grasped and come to the understanding of owning the bad news, there is not this foundation that is available for those who have not placed their faith and trust in Christ to have real joy that life's circumstances cannot take away. They can have happiness, for at least a third of the population, right? And yet, depending upon your circumstances, and circumstances change, what's in your Happy Meal are going to be different. Eventually, the fries and the nuggets are going to get cold, right? And so happiness, you can have that for a certain amount of time in your life, depending upon things kind of arranging and, you know, whatever luck you might have. But joy goes deeper. And Paul is talking about that the joy that I have gives a perspective of my past, gives a perspective of my past, gives me a hope for what's going to happen in the future, and gives me the grace, the grace-filled joy to endure in the present, whatever I am facing. We're going to walk through how Paul talks about his past, how Paul talks about his hope for his future, and how Paul is able to endure with the grace that God has given him, what is occurring in his presence, in his, in his present, because it is all founded on the gospel. That is where his joy is. Very interesting here in the first verse, as Paul is saying to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi. Now, he is calling them saints. He is saying, essentially, by calling them saints, those who have responded to this good news. They've accepted the bad news. They have seen Jesus as the only way for the good news, the bad news to be reversed and the good news to be applied. He calls them saints. Now, I looked up on the internet what it is required in some people's estimation of what it means to be a saint, right? You probably have heard this before. You know, there's there's Saint Jude, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, the, he's the saint for the children. There's various de designations. There's, there's the saint of the inter internet, right? I forget who that is. But there is a certain prescription or requirements that some people say is required in order for you to be declared as, as a saint. And so I kind of walk through these on the internet. They're very, very interesting. One, in order for you to be called a saint, you have to be a martyr. And so if you are a, a martyr, if you've given your life for Christ, you are just automatically just, you're, you're a saint, right? If you're not martyred, then you have to, A, have a reputation of what was called heroic godly life. And that can only be determined five years after your death. So I guess a little committee comes together and they say you have been above um, the norm, 
of what a Christian should be and your reputation beyond your years placed upon this earth, okay, we've come to agreement you're a saint. Another requirement is that you have to perform a miracle. And then in 2017, Pope Francis has added another one. In order for you to be a saint, you can also become a saint if you've given your life for someone else. Now, when I look at all those, here's the requirement of sainthood. You have to die. In order for you to be declared a saint, you have to give your life for someone else. You have to be a martyr. It cannot, you cannot be declared a saint until after your death because sometimes your dirty laundry comes out after you die, right? Um, but the requirement, according to some, for sainthood is that you have to die. Paul's definition of sainthood is, is, is not that. He calls the Philippians saints. And by the way, this is not the only time that Paul calls people that he writes to saints. He called the Romans as he's writing to the Roman believers, he calls them saints. They had belief issues that Paul needed to correct. Paul also called the Corinthian church, the believers there, he called them saints. And they were definitely not, if you've read the letters to the Corinthian church, they did not live very saintly lives. They were involved in all kinds of immorality, so much so that non-believers were looking at them and going, whoa, that, they're, that's bad. And so it seems like Paul is saying, here's the requirement for sainthood. Have you responded to the good news? That's so encouraging to me. Because even though there are times when Paul would write letters of correction, and if you have a good father, you know, that, have di that has disciplined you, Paul disciplines his spiritual children this way. He always reminds them of who they are before he brings to light what they've done. And it is always in the context of, you know, the way that you're acting or the way that you're believing, this is not who you are. You're a saint, so, so live like it. If you've ever been disciplined by your, by your father in the right way, hopefully your father did not say to you, you are just scum on the earth, you're no child of mine, blah, blah, blah. They correct you in the idea of, of, of this, you know, the way that you acted, or that choice that you made, that's not who you are. That, that's not how a son or a daughter of mine acts. Remind you of corrective belief or behavior in the context of who has made you, right? And so Paul is talking to the saints here, and then he gives them this idea of his joy, just as their sainthood is founded and grounded in the gospel. Also, their joy, as Paul's joy is, is founded and grounded in the gospel. And when that occurs, life's circumstances cannot take your joy away. Now, as you can kind of remember as we walked through this passage, not walked through, as we just read this passage a few moments ago, maybe you picked up a little bit of this, how Paul's joy is extended to his past, to his future, what hasn't happened yet, and then also to his present situation. So let's walk through that here just briefly. Paul's joy, not only is it grounded and founded in the gospel, but also Paul's joy allowed him to have a thankfulness for his past. Verse, verse four picks this up and he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So he's reflecting back on his time in Philippi. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all my joy. Verse five, for your fellowship in the gospel, the good news is what we shared together from the first day when we first met until now. So Paul is reflecting upon his past through the lens of the gospel and there's nothing but joy. Now, if you were able to be with us last week, either in person or through YouTube, Paul's time spent in Philippi, we would probably call not real good. Never intended to go there. He didn't want to go there. When he went there, he was trying to find someone that he never met. He was harassed by a demon-possessed woman, mocking them as they're trying to preach the gospel. 
Eventually, Paul deals with that situation, and as a result, they're thrown into prison, into jail, where they were, before that happened, they were severely beaten within an inch, you know, of their life. They're treated horribly. They're disrespected. Paul should have looked through that lens of his past in Philippi, and if you looked through it with probably the eyes of you and I, he would probably go, that was a horrible time. That was awful. You know, met this demon-possessed woman, and finally when we dealt with her and delivered her from that demon possession, as a reward for that, we get thrown into jail. We're beaten before we're thrown into jail. And then finally when we're released, when it was unjust, we were treated with such disrespect and we're asked to leave the city very, very strongly. You see, Paul would have reflected upon that time if he reflected it through the, the lens of his circumstance and would have went, that was awful. I don't ever want to go back there. But Paul does not reflect on his time spent in Philippi through the lens of a circumstance. He reflects through the lens of the gospel and it brought him joy. Why? Well, he met a, a person there by the name of Lydia. Lydia responded to the bad news first, guilt she responded then to the good news of Jesus. There was whole, wholeness. She responded to the gospel, her and her entire household. As a result of being thrown into prison and a miracle that occurred, which Paul never mentions, by the way, in the book of Philippians. But a miracle occurred beside the physical miracle. There was a spiritual miracle that occurred there. The Roman jailer fell down at Paul's feet and said, what must I do to be saved? And that started the Philippian church. So in spite of all those negative things that happened while Paul was in Philippi, he doesn't choose to view his time through the lens of his circumstance. He chooses to view his time spent in Philippi through the lens of the gospel. And joy was the result. You've probably heard me say this that we don't see things, especially our past. We all have selective memory. You don't see things as well as I don't see things through how they are. We see them how we are. Depending on who we are, what lens we choose to view our past through will determine our joy. If you view your past through the lens of insecurity or hurt or disappointment or fear or guilt, you will look at your past and you will not have joy. And there are people who live their life like that. They choose to view what has happened to them through a particular lens of what was done to them or their insecurity or their guilt or their difficulty or whatever it may be, instead of the lens of how God worked and how God arranged circumstances, even if they were hurtful, to bring them to a point to where the gospel was promoted. See, when Paul looked back at his time with the Philippian church, he could have used the lens of the injustice of being thrown in the jail. He could have used the lens of being beaten. He could have used the lens of, of this injustice that occurred to him. He could have used the lens of, you know what? We went there, we didn't want to be there, and this is how we're treated. He could have chose to use any of those lenses to view his past, and there wouldn't have been joy, but he chose to view the past through the lens of what occurred when the gospel was received. And when he did that, he didn't even mention jail. He didn't mention the beating. He didn't mention the, the, the girl that had this demon in her and he, and he exercised that demon, cast that demon out. And she didn't even respond to the gospel. She just kind of went along in her own business and they were thrown in. He could have responded by that, but he didn't. He looked at his past very differently than most people. Not only his past, but also the gospel, that lens allowed him to view his future, what was going to occur. And according to Paul, he didn't quite know. We'll, we'll read more about that in the letter to the Philippians. Let's look at the scripture. This is verse 
6, Paul's joy gave him confidence in the future. Verse 6 says this, being confident of this very thing, no matter what happens, that he who has begun a good work in you, and he's reflecting upon the people in Philippi, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. This is why Paul's hope in the future is joyful. He talks about the confidence that he has because people have responded to the gospel. Their future is bright. Three things that he's confident in here. First, he was confident, first, that they responded to their guilt. You cannot have a good work begun in you unless you first admit guilt. And after guilt, there comes grace. When you admit that you are guilty, there is grace. After grace, there is growing. And so he talks about that there's this progression and we're all works in progress. Paul will talk more about this in his letter. He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Not that I've already a achieved all this. He's talking about his, himself personally, but he's talking here collectively with the, with the Philippian believers. He says, he who has begun, there has to be a beginning, that's about a response to guilt. After guilt, there is grace. That he has begun a good, good work, will carry it on. There is this progressive work, we call this sanctification or growing in our faith. And then there's this guarantee. We'll carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. There is security in knowing whose you are. And so Paul is able to look at the future no matter what happens through this lens of the gospel. There was guilt, there was grace, there's growing, you're not a finished product yet, and yet it's living a life of gratitude, not trying to earn it, but just living up to who you are and understand this, that the end, no matter what, when that comes, there's a guarantee there's a guarantee that this flesh that you and I wrestle with and struggle with will be no more. You see, according to Paul, the future is so bright, he has to wear shades, right? And there was a song, I think, in the 80s about that, right? I'm an 80s kid. But he's saying our future is so bright. That is why my joy is complete. This is why I have confidence that no matter what happens, because we are saints, there was guilt, there was grace, there was growing ingratitude, and I'm holding on to that guarantee. And that also, not just in the past, not also in the future, but also there is this grace. There is this gospel that gives us grace in our present circumstance. Look what Paul says. Just as it is right for me, this is verse 8, just as it is right for me to think of this for all of you, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my chains, as what he was presently going through, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, because of God's grace, no matter what happens to me, I can be joyful. You see, Paul's definition of Desiring grace in his present circumstance is very different from ours. You see, when we ask for grace, when we cry out for God, God, give us grace in this present circumstance, it's usually because we want a removal, a removal of whatever that is that we think is, is causing pain and difficulty in our life. We want, we want grace to, to remove whatever that is. We want grace so we can be spared whatever that situation that we are currently going through. Paul could have prayed that. I, I'm praying that I have grace to be spared this present situation that I'm in because I'm in chains. But this is what Paul's prayer for grace was. I pray that I have grace, not so much to be spared, but grace that no matter whether I'm in chains or not in chains, that I will have grace to share. Not spared, but share. And what's he sharing? The good news. As Paul is looking at his present situation, he is praying, and he's praying as well for his spiritual children here, the believers in Philippi, and they're in a difficult spot too. It was not all rainbows and candy living in, in Philippi. 
They came under persecution. It was a difficult place to live. But his prayer for himself, as well as for his spiritual children, that they would be given grace, not so they would be spared so much, that whether they're in chains or whether they're not, no matter it's difficult situations or pleasant circumstances, that they would be given grace, not to be spared, but they would be given grace so that they can share with integrity, defense, and confirmation of the gospel. And when I look at Paul, he used his chains well. <laughs> the people that were chained to him will eventually will find out. Paul will say, it has become evident to members of Caesar's household of the good news of Jesus. Who were those people he was referring to? Well, he was referring to the guys that he was chained to. They were the same guards that were in Caesar's household. It had been very evident that Paul was preaching the gospel while he was in chains to the one. That was a captive audience. He was not praying for grace to be spared. He was praying for grace so that he could share. What a perspective. And that was his joy. Oh, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. May we reflect upon our joy through how Paul reflected the lens of the gospel. God bless.